Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us again today. Today, the BBC reported that President Biden said of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. And he also said that he thought Gaza should have total access to all food and medicine for the next six to eight weeks. How do you respond to these words? <clears throat> Thank you, James. It, uh, first of all, it's uh, an honor again to be <clears throat> to meet you and to have an interview with the Times of Malta, which I fully respect. <clears throat> and uh, I also want to thank you warmly for having our families of the objectives yesterday in the Times of Malta, giving the floor. <clears throat> Israel is in its war for six months. There is not an anniversary that we are happy. We don't celebrate it. We, write, we say we commemorate it. But it's with a lot of sorrow, a lot of grief. And we know that the war brings a pain for both sides. Again. Okay, and I, I would like to to mention something in in that regard, um, because obviously recently there was the uh, attack on the convoy operated by World Central Kitchen on April the first, um, which the Guardian said uh, Israel had even confirmed that the WCK had correctly coordinated its movements in advance, but it was still attacked. Why was this convoy targeted? First of all, war, unfortunately, also have tragic mistakes. And uh, according to the investigation, it was a military mistake by the high-level commander on the spot, and it should not happen. No, in, indeed. And, and, but I think that's the point, right? That, I mean, you mentioned that mistakes do happen in war. You've made it clear before, even in previous meetings we've had, that, um, that there isn't any military force which is, in your words, as selective as, as, and as distinctive as the IDF. Doesn't this latest incident show that's not the case? I don't believe so. Again, uh, as you know, I'm a retired officer, but I'm not anymore in the combat service. I am sure they do, and I know it from first hand, what they share with us, the IDF and the foreign ministry, that they do their best to make sure that <coughs> keeping the laws of war, of war, humanitarian law of war, to the best way they can. So there was truly no intention. I mean, the, why the idea, for God's sake, will pinpoint, will target civilians which came to help sacred mission. But again, so returning to those words from President Biden, which has been, the United States has been a key ally of Israel. He said that what he thinks the head of your government is doing is a mistake. So what is the response to this from possibly your most important ally? No doubt, the United States is number one ally by far. Yes, there is a change, not for the positive in the United States attitude toward Israel. As a, forget for a, that I am a diplomat, as a citizen of Israel, I am concerned. Yes, I do follow the statements. But I do believe that the relations and the strength of the allies that we have in the United States is stronger than any difference of opinion. Uh, it's not up to me to analyze. I mean, there will be better academians that will do it. But I'm sure we do the, our utmost. And I know that the diplomatic uh, department of our foreign ministry dealing with the United States uh, is doing our utmost to see that the relations will stay as strong as they, as they were. OK, thank you. So now let's turn to something uh, somebody else uh, very sort of visible in international media has said, which is actually Malta's permanent representative to the United Nations, uh, Vanessa Fraser. In a statement last Friday, she said, since the outbreak of this conflict, Israel has obstructed a meaningful humanitarian aid scale up in Gaza by placing onerous, arbitrary bureaucratic and administrative impediments on aid delivery. And crucially, she said that tent poles, chemotherapy drugs, and basic commodities are being blocked from entering Gaza. Why are tent poles and chemotherapy being blocked? <clears throat> I'm not going to quarrel with uh, Maltese ambassador of the United Nations. It's not my role. I can tell you that uh, Israel is not hindering the opposite. We are supplying Gaza with full humanitarian assistance. We opened the border crossing. We gave the green light to supply the Palestinians from Ashdod and many, many other examples. Again, what your ambassador in UN is saying, again, it's not up to me. I'm a diplomat, she's a professional diplomat. My style is to firstly 
speak with the decision maker before coming public. Okay, so do you think there's, there's no problem with the dual use policy being used to obstruct the items that I've just mentioned there, temp poles, chemotherapy drugs. And this isn't just Vanessa Fraser saying it, it's also the Egyptian Red Crescent, and it's been very widely reported in the media. I mean, are, are you saying that these items have not been prevented from entering Gaza? <coughs> I'm not aware of intentional blocking of humanitarian assistance to the population in Gaza. But unintentional is possible. Hmm? But unintentional is possible. I mean, as I said, I mean, you mentioned before the tragic uh, deaths of these seven members of uh, <coughs> the WC. Okay? So, I mean, as I said, no country, no entity, no army is immune of mistakes. But I'm sure there is no policy hope of obstructing a nation that suffered the Holocaust would never, never dare to un intentionally arm any other nation. Okay, okay. But if I can just stop you on on that briefly, I mean, recently uh, Israel uh, carried out a strike in uh, Damascus, um, which impacted the uh, Iranian uh, consulate there. I mean, how do you respond to, to fears that not only is this inflaming the region, but this is exactly what you said, that this, this is crossing into Syrian territory and also impacting on the Iranian consulate? First of all, Israel has never... You took what the Iranians have said as total truth. I would differ than you on that issue. I mean, you're right that Israel has not admitted responsibility for this. Israel has never admitted of attacking Iranian consulate. Secondly, it was never, according to what I know, it was not a consulate. Thirdly, we don't have any, we want to, win, to live in peace. The 8th of October, Hezbollah started the war against us in the northern border of Israel, forcing Israel to evacuate tens of thousands of citizens from the north of Israel, not to mention that more than 100 citizens from south of Israel. Who is the main culprit of this spillover of the conflict? Is one nation named Iran. Iran, in these days, and you are quoting everybody, you forgot to quote the new Washington Post report about the fact that Iran is closest than ever to developing military, nuclear capability. The same Iran which is supplying the Hezbollah, the same Iran which is through Syria, the same Iran forces which are in, based in Syria, the same Iranian which is now having a stronghold in Sudan, same Iranian which supplies the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. I don't say that the 7th of October attack was it is instigated by the Iranians. I think they will mightly be surprised. But the Iranian fingerprints are also damaging Malta because Malta is being damaged by the Houthis blocking the Babel Mandan Straits. Your economy is seriously damaged by the Iranians. I don't hear the international community coming with a call to Iran, stop all of it. <clears throat> Before blaming us, one has to look at the wider perspective, and I expect members of Security Council in Slovenia, Malta, United States, Great UK and others to put the Iranians and to pay the, at least the diplomatic price of what they are doing, instead of blaming Israel. And when Iran is threatening now, retaliate against Israel, did you ask yourself the questions? Italia for what? In October, for example, Benjamin Netanyahu said that all Hamas terrorists are dead men walking, okay, above ground, below ground, outside of Gaza. With this in mind, why is it that Israel is continuing to displace and kill tens of thousands of people in Gaza, but not moving against high-ranking Hamas officials in other countries, including Qatar? Why? Again, I'm not... Just military strategies, as you know, maybe in my second uh, career I could become, because of my hobby of aviation military history, but I'm joking. Uh, the, I would say that I'm, we made clear already the <coughs> very clear uh, targets of this war. It's a war that only inflicted to us, a war of self-defense. When one fights terrorism, and uh, first of all, it should be clear also to the neutral Malta, 
that war against tourism should be all the necessity, it's a necessity and the must of the international community, including Malta, to defend and to be part of a coalition. I'm not saying for, I'm not proposing that Malta should lose its neutrality, but to be a part of a coalition, whatever forms of this coalition, to fight against terrorism. And I'm not sure myself that assassination is the best way to fight terrorism. I think the must is to be fully committed not only Israel, all the freedom, democracy, like against ISIS. Hamas is worse than ISIS. Okay, and Hamas is being supported by Iran. ISIS was a different entity. By the way, you see ISIS is coming back. And so, but, so, but doesn't that mean if they are this awful organization, which I think few people would dispute with you, their leaders anywhere in the world should therefore presumably be brought to justice, right? So if, if, you, if you are aware that there are leaders of Hamas in Qatar, and I am not suggesting assassination, capture perhaps. But why is Israel making no moves to act in, in those places when it seems to have no problem with working against the opinion of the international community to continue a war that many people now feel is deeply unpopular? <clears throat> I think the war against terrorism is first for multidimensional. It's deserve coalition of the right of the right of the right nations, diplomacy, economic means against nations of supporting terrorism. I mentioned Iran, maybe Qatar is part of them because but we also want the objectives back home. Now, if, let yeah. me finish, please. If U.S. said pinpoint, don't necessarily kill, capture, whatever, this architect is sitting in Qatar, how would you negotiate and bring his objectives back home? I mean, I'm just thinking loudly about the dilemmas. Working, having the war against terrorism, it's very complicated. It's full of dilemmas. Okay, so, I understand that. But what you've just said there seems to indicate that the two things that firstly there is there is no way to get the hostages back while threatening the leaders of Hamas and also you you seem to imply there that negotiating is one way of actually bringing the hostages back if if that's the case why have negotiations not so, gone further i don't know what is the best strategy or what is the best strategy it could be some negotiation. The first wave, first half of the 240 hostages were released because of negotiations, or thanks to negotiations. Very few were released in military operation, very dirty military operation, in sm smaller scales in Entebbe, but they were released. <clears throat> but I think at the end of the day, it's a must to bring them back home. I, I think what we can discuss is for hours what is the best, and I am not a terrorist specialist, neither do you. And uh, it's something which the world maybe has not experienced such extent of terrorism for many, many years. There is no one, I would say, prescription how to fight terrorism. Uh -huh. You have to think outside of the box how to fight terrorism and how to bring you hostages back home. Okay, and, and I appreciate it. it's a very complex issue, but it, you just said something there which to me was very striking. The majority of the people who've been released, that happened during negotiations and that during a time of conflict, relatively few were released. In your opinion, and I'm not asking you to be a, a, a terrorist analyst, don't worry, but which in I'm your not. opinion, and neither am I, in your opinion, therefore, based on what you've just said, do you think that negotiations have a better chance at getting hostages back than military operations? Again, as I said, I'm not in the details. I'm not sitting in this special headquarters dealing with hostages issues, and I don't, want, I don't envy the people which are. I think that all, every day, every moment, they consider what is the best strategy. Ah, but your personal opinion? In my personal opinion, the readers of Times of Malta, I'm not a specialist, I can voluntarily tell you my, from my diplomatic experience. And I think, as I said, it's up to the people there to decide. I gave you the information, which is publicly known, that one of the, or half of the one, 240 originally abducted were released in a deal that we paid, uh, I don't remember the exact ratio, because for us, you know, one soul is all the universe.
By the way, also Palestinian soul is all universal, it's not only Jewish soul. So we were ready to pay every price. There was a deal that was criticized in later stage that we released one soldier that was kidnapped by the Hamas for more than 1,000 terrorists. Among them, the, the terrorists which <laughs> led the operation, which instigated the operation. We released it for Israel jail. People ask themselves, you know, crazy. So this is also part of the consideration. What will happen if we release all those in the next, next negotiation? They will come back to the West Bank, again, instigating terrorist attacks against the Israeli population. What are you doing? So, but I don't envy the dilemma that we are facing, but you saw the families. They want, you know, it's not only their personal stories. I think it's a story, it's a moral degree, because Israel on the 7th of October was in complete blackout, intelligence, and we admit it. Yeah. We don't keep it under the carpet. It's intelligence, it's operations, everything. And it's neglection of the Israeli government, the Israeli authorities, the IDF, the Secret Service, everybody. And we have to do our utmost to bring them back home. And, and, and absolutely. You mentioned the families there. And on Sunday, Reporting on recent protests by families of hostages, the Times of Israel said that anti-government sentiment is growing amongst the families, with one relative reportedly accusing Benjamin Netanyahu of torpedoing the talks. I mean, how do you respond to these sentiments from the relatives of people who are being held hostage, the families, that the government isn't doing enough to hammer out an agreement? I mean, this person said they're torpedoing the talks. Clearly, they want to negotiate a situation to this. And not always. Diplomats have best answers. Some, some questions they don't have best answers. I think what is what you have said now is evidence of the strength of the Israeli democracy. As I said to the abductees families before they came here, you are not represent. I am not your censor. Say whatever you want. Do whatever. We help them to come abroad. We finance their visits abroad, but we are not interfering. So also in Israel and also abroad, they have all the right to say whatever they want and to do their utmost to bring the abductees if they think that the Israeli government is up to them to know because they may be no better than me. It's not up to me to judge. So and what I think is the strength of the Israeli government. You see every Saturday thousands of people are on the street. And some of them they are joined, some of them support point A, some of them are against. And so I mean, the dilemmas are on both sides, and I don't envy the dilemmas that the Palestinian family says. As I said, I mean, war is an horrible thing, it's not just a cliche. Is Israel's withdrawal from southern Gaza a sign that, the, that it is preparing to end the conflict, that the war might soon be coming to a close? I don't know. As I said, I'm a diplomat and I'm not in the operative plans of the IDF. And the other day, I don't think we have any wish to stay in Gaza. I mean, Riel Sharon, late prime minister, decided to withdraw from Gaza. And unfortunately, the Hamas took over in 2007, which I'm sure you know. And uh, so I don't know what will, what will be the next stage. I mean, as I said, I've, I have no uh, crystal ball to know exactly what. As I said, I'm not in the, the headquarters. And uh, I think when one builds a strategy, he has to take into consideration the military dimension, the diplomatic dimension, the economic dimension. So the war is heavy. And as I said, well, my main personal concern is a possible escalation, a possible military conflict with the Hezbollah in the north, because the armament that the Hezbollah has, thanks to the great Iranians, are immense. The dilemmas are immense. And you have to continue your life. So I don't have the crystal ball. Uh, I hope that this war will be over as soon as possible, but the target of the war has to be achieved. Whether it will take two months, three months, four months, one year. In the beginning of the <coughs> 2000, uh, <coughs> between 2001 and 2005, the IDF and Secret Service were daily operating in the West Bank because we lost hundreds of Israeli civilians for terrorist suicide attack by the Hamas at that time. So I don't know. I mean, as I said, it's very difficult to... It sounds like just because the troops are moving out of the south, it, it doesn't sound like that is an indication that the war is coming to I don't know. I, I, no, I said, I said two, if it took I, two months, two years, whatever. I, I really don't know. I mean, 
And as I said, diploma doesn't mean that you have an answer for any questions. One last, one last point. Um, what is Israel's reaction to Palestine's, uh, the Palestinian Authority's recently renewed application to join the UN? It's, it's not, a, first of all, I think when one thinks about peace with the Palestinians at the end of the day, you think if you make still a poll today, even in, the, in this time of the war, people want to believe that they can live in peace with our Palestinian friends, Palestinian neighbors. Uh, but the way to get to the peace is through direct negotiations. No forced uh, formula. Okay, but and using the, diplom the diplomatic arena is one of their means, because you might say they don't have any other means, so they go to whatever means they can use. I think it will be destructive to, because they don't, they don't feel the criteria for Why? being, I mean, look legally, look politically, they, they don't have one territory, they have the Palestinian entity in the West Bank, Palestinian entity in Gaza, their leadership, is not really being reformed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, I don't think it's up to us now to analyze. They don't don't fill the criteria. So going to the United Nations using the automatic majority in the United Nations General Assembly by the non-aligned movement, the Arab League, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they have to go firstly through a committee, as you ambassador of the United Nations, I'm sure, specialized in that. Then they have to go with uh, through the Security Council, and each member of Security Council as his opinion, and uh, so I don't know. If you ask me, I don't think it's constructive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.